Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Pepper, and I am blessed and happy to be the moderator this evening for Nevada County Television's Nevada County Pride Celebration. So first thing we'd like to do this evening is to take just a moment, ground ourselves, come here, and I want to read a dedication, please. We acknowledge that we are located on the ancestral and unceded traditional territories of the Nisenan peoples. We acknowledge this not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have lived in relationship with this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. Additionally, we acknowledge that this is a point of reflection for all of us as we work towards dismantling colonial and white supremacist practices. Aho. So again, um, my name is Pepper. My pronouns are she and her. And I just want to let you know, as you saw maybe on the flyer, Reverend Rafe Ellis was going to be with us this evening. And Reverend Rafe, Rafe had a um, dental emergency and had to step out. And we are blessed and honored to have our local councilwoman, Ms. Hillary Hodge, here. Um, she was more than willing to step up and help us out. So thank you so much. And on that, I'd like to take this um, opportunity to let each of our panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Hillary Hodge. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I identify as queer. By day, I'm the marketing and donor services manager for Music in the Mountains, our local classical nonprofit education and performance organization. And by night, I'm your elected official serving on your Grass Valley City Council. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Hillary. Hi, I'm Auntie Weiss. I'm also known as Dr. Rebecca Blanton in my regular life. I am a kink educator and writer based here in Grass Valley. I was the executive director for the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls prior to moving up here and doing something much more respectable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Del Phoenix. Um, I am, let's see, wow. I'm just gonna say queer. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, I, I fit at least three if not more of the letters, alphabet soup, um, <laughs> including MSW. I am a social worker by trade, currently practicing uh, private therapy with the queer community. My education background is in LGBT and gender studies, and I am very happy to be here. And I'm oh, Pepper. Pronouns. Pronouns? <laughs> My pronouns are they or he. Oh yeah, I totally fifth mine. So I use all <laughs> pronouns and I am agender and queer. She her. She, she her. She her. She her. Um, so I'm Pepper, and my, my background as far as we're, for, for this purpose tonight is kind of social activism. Um, I was born, I'm the I in the alphabet soup. I was born intersex, so um, what used to be called hermorphodite or eunuch back in the old days, and those children were left to die um, or often killed. And so I think my whole life, um, social activism, social justice, equal rights has just been built right into me. Um, so for the purposes of tonight, that's my, that's my accreditation, okay? So we're gonna get started with some questions for our panel. And the first question, forgive me while I use my iPad because all those questions about how did you become a minister are no longer relevant. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess the, the thing that most people wonder, especially, so I'm also a real estate agent and I have a lot of people to move up from the Bay and they're like, how do I find people? So how do you find other queer members of our community? Mm -hmm. Panel, take it away. I think it's a lot easier now than it was 15 years ago. I spent 10 years not knowing where to find the queer community. I knew a few individuals and that was it. Um, but now, I mean, we have the Nevada County Queer Forum on Facebook. We have NevadaCountyPride.org um, as a website who hosts uh, monthly, bar or monthly potlucks. Mm -hmm. And you know, several organizations over the last few years have stepped up to provide a lot of different services in the county. 
Nice. I moved up three years ago to Nevada County. Luckily, I had been working in the area prior to that, and I connected through women's groups. I had worked with a lot of women who do various forms of political outreach, and the, the Venn diagram of highly political social activists in the democratic spectrum and lesbians is a very tight overlap, <laughs> uh, so that made it easy. I am also incredibly out as kinky and queer online, so people found me. So the more, like, they'd see a post, they're like, there's another queer woman up here. Because uh, <laughs> we're kind of like the candle with, with all the moths. So I find the more open I've been about my sexuality, the more I've found, and it didn't take very long at all to find a very large group of queer women. They're just all, we're hidden in them there hills up here. Um, <laughs> but you can connect with them and then um, finding social events. There's drag events. Um, my partner and I are, opening a new uh, monthly LGBT comedy night, um, that type of stuff. We just connected with another woman who wants to do a regular queer poetry night. So starting to create those social ones where you can connect in something that's fun and you have a, a similar interest. Okay. Yeah, I think sometimes you look for people and sometimes people find you. Uh, I think being out and open and available as much as possible is really helpful. I remember moving up here 13 years ago, maybe a little longer than that now, and just wondering if there was another gay person in the whole wide world than Nevada County. Um, so for anybody who is feeling a little alone or struggling, just give it time. You'll find, you'll find people. It, it does, they're here. We're here. We're queer. We're queer. Get used Get to used it. To it. <laughs> I agree. I, I moved here 13 years ago, and I moved here with, with a woman, and so it was, I had her group of friends, and then same thing, I think, you know, I was very, um, I live out loud, whether it's my recovery or my sexuality, I live out loud, and so I think we, we've been able to kind of gravitate towards each other, but I started doing like Gay Day at the Yuba, mm -hmm. right. and you know, which is, is hopefully coming back for everyone who's wondering, it's going to be maybe a little reworked to be more conscious of the environment, um, but it is coming back. If you don't know, Gay Day at the Yuba was how many people came to the last one? A few thousand? Yep. To the Yuba. So there are lots of events if you're if you're plugged in and stay mindful. And again, as we said, NevadaCountyPride.org. We've now, as of yesterday, have a complete calendar for the whole year. So if you want to see what's coming up, or if you have an event that you want on the calendar, please just email us. Our email is all over the website, and we'll put it on the calendar. The burlesque show is on it. So, yeah. So fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Um, so so. We've talked a little bit about how to find each other. Now, how do we find resources? Okay. So. And Del, I'd love you to start on that because that's kind of your, your belly wick. <laughs> so resources, we currently have, um, starting with Neo, has the Rainbow Social, which is monthly. It's currently on hold until the fall. We also have Color Me Human with their support group. They took over for um, the old P Flag support group, mm -hmm. which is also monthly online on Zoom only, and that is also on hold until fall. Um, but we have all these wonderful summer events <laughs> to keep us going. Um, we also have the Placer County PFLAG that anybody is welcome to. They have wonderful educational sessions as well as support groups. Uh, Can you tell the community what PFLAG is in case everyone doesn't know? PFLAG is parents and friends of uh, lesbians and gays. And when I first moved here, that was the only, only organization that, you know, represented our community. And I assumed, coming from the larger city, that it was only for family and friends um, and did not reach out. And that was actually a big miss for me, you know, which is, I think, partially why I was not connected to community for as long as I was. Because for a long time, they were the only people here really holding down the fort for our community. So. I, I just want to keep going for a second with you, Del. Also, how about um, mental health? Um, so connections and mental health resources. resources. So I do, I, I am a therapist um, and unfortunately my case code is full right now, but I have a resource list out in the front and can provide that to anybody um, of queer therapists, queer informed therapists, all of whom that I've personally vetted. Um, we do have Sierra Therapy Center here in town with some very wonderful therapists. I've trained them. I also do clinical trainings and gender, diver gender diversity trainings for the community as well as clinicians. 
Um, so Fantastic. we have that available. And I can always point people towards other resources. And then Sacramento, we have the LGBT Center, we have the Gender Health Center, and the Lavender Library, and Sacramento Gems Thank for you. the transgender community. Thanks, Dale. How about for kink? <laughs> we, are, we are a little more quiet up here than we are in Sacramento, but there are several very great kink groups. Um, the Facebook version for kinky people is fetlife.com, and it's just Facebook with a lot more nudes. Um, <laughs> it, it really is. It's, it's not that much more interesting, but it does list all the local events. There is the bdsmevents.org, which carries a long list of events, and then there's a few of us who are very out about it, and I... I'm happy to connect people with the appropriate communities up here. Since I've been up here, I've had quite a few people reach out through social media and say, hey, I'm looking for a kink-friendly therapist or I'm looking for a kink-friendly doctor. Um, we don't have much in terms on uh, national lists, like the, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom uh, maintains a list of kink-aware practitioners, but there's nobody listed in town on there. So for those of us who known people who who've used the services you know they reach out and that's part of what i've been doing up here is just helping people connect to the appropriate uh folks and groups and then once you connect with one person we'll help you get vetted for the other private groups because it tends to be a much more private community up here so whether you're looking for a women's group or a queer group or a men's group we can kind of point you with the right people to talk to at that point because not everybody wants to be out and as open um, as kinky. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once you find one or two people and everybody's welcome, I'm Auntie Vice on all social media everywhere. Uh, <laughs> as much, I'm old, but I'm on TikTok. Uh, and I, I am happy to point people in the direction of more private connections up here. Thanks, Auntie Vice. Yeah. Well, so I know I'm not the facilitator, but for the unanointed, what yeah. is kink and BDSM? So kink and BDSM for the, the I don't know, is anybody unanointed? It's on Bob's Burgers. How is, how is, like Bob's What's Burgers. Bob's Burgers? <laughs> Bob's Burgers, the cartoon did a whole balloon fetish episode. Like, I, I kind of assume people, Go on. it's the whole whips and chains <laughs> and leather thing. Yeah, that really scandalous stuff of people running around in puppy mask and, you know, saying, you know, more daddy, more mistress. Um, there's a lot of that, and it, it's a huge overlap with the queer community. Our sexuality hasn't been accepted. Kink folks felt like their sexuality wasn't accepted. We tend to gravitate to the, towards the same thing. And up here, um, there is an enormous group of gay bears, the, the bigger, hairier guys who like to go out and lay in the sun, and there's an entire gay men's nude hiking group in the area, right? Um, so if that's your thing, we can point you in the right direction. Um, but, you know, it, unlike being out and queer, it's a, it still carries a little more stigma, so people tend to be a little more under wraps with it. Um, so it's more connecting with one person in the community, and then we're happy to connect you with lots. We talk a lot. Thank you. Hillary, how about how to find resources to become politically active in our community? How would one do that if they are looking for social equity or to support the people they love in their lives who may be queer? So I, I, have, I have many things to say about this. Um, <laughs> particularly about about wh which part of political office you should run for. But there are incredible training groups. Um, Emerge California specifically trains Democratic women. Um, and I am a graduate of that program. It's been, it's changed my life. It's an incredible group of incredible women. The mayor of Oakland, the mayor of San Francisco, um, many, many women uh, at at our state legislative level as well, have been through that program. Um, but there are a number of LGBTQ uh, training programs. Uh, the Sacramento political scene has a lot of resources as well. But locally, I would say get in touch with your Nevada County Democrats. Um, maybe you're not necessarily a Democrat, but that is the um, friendlier, more well-established, uh, friendly to the LGBT community um, organization, and, and they're quite effective and, and quite wonderful and will definitely help anybody who is interested. 
Um, if you care about politics locally, I highly recommend you run for school board, please. And, and, and reach out to someone who like can help with that. Um, the other thing that I do want to touch on a little bit in terms of resources that I think is really important is that we have in the last two years um, a state superintendent in Tony Thurmond who has worked really hard to expand non-gender specific bathrooms in our local public school system. And I think that this is really, really important. And I think one of the other pieces of that that most people may or may not quite realize, but six years ago, Assembly Bill 1732 was passed by the California legislation and signed into law by Jerry Brown. Assembly Bill 1732 designates all single stall bathrooms as non-gender. There are still a number, this is the law, this is the state law, this is currently the law of the land in California. There are still a number of single use bathrooms in this community that have gender designations. That is currently not the law. That is not what those signs should say. So if you are ever in a business and you wanna be an ally, um, please let the manager know that their bathroom signs are out of date. I think that's a really helpful way to sort of kind of wedge in a bit. Um, and, and, you know, know, know what's on the books for what resources we have as a community, know what, how we can support. And that's one of the ways there are lots, but that's my cross to bear. That's something that I do all the time where I'm like, guess what? Fix your signs. I love actionable yeah. items. <laughs> it's a big issue for our community, especially in terms of safety. So, yeah. so let's keep going with this, okay? So one, one of the things that is in the public eye right now nationally is our trans youth. Right. And across the board, there is a lot of, of stigma challenges, um, assumptions, laws being passed. Right. Um, and as a woman who is intersex, this has always been a, would you like to see my birth certificate or my oh. genitalia before, just because I present as female? I'm actually medically not. So it's an issue that has, has really triggered me in a lot of ways. I'd like to talk about here in our community, what are we doing or what are we hoping to do right. to support not only our trans youth, but our youth as they maybe venture out with and explore their identification. Right. So let's talk about the, the, the kids. Right. Let's talk about the kids. So first, I forgot to mention, we almost all of our middle schools and our high schools have GSAs in them, Gay Straight Alliance groups. And that is one really valuable resource Absolutely. for our youth, um, especially those who don't have support at home. So, but in terms of safety, that's a really big issue. We have currently in 2021, or 2022, since January, we've had 238 anti-LGBT bills, most of them anti-trans. How many? 238, 238 anti, anti, anti LGBT bills. Oh. Yeah. So, and when we think about safety, you know, just two days ago in Coeur d'Alene, you know, 31 white supremacists tried to riot on the Pride celebration there. Also in a state where it is illegal now to treat, to provide gender affirming services for trans youth. So, we are really blessed here in California to have the services that we have available. We're also really blessed to have laws like the bathroom law. Um, you know, as a transgender person, I'm non-binary, but I'm also transmasculine. If I were to walk into a women's bathroom right now, most of the women would be, would be really scared. When I walk into a men's bathroom, I'm the one that's scared. Yeah. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It really is. Thanks for that, Tom. But for our youth, it really is a matter of like safety, protecting them. Um, I think it was 2015, one of our local youth won the Sacramento News and Review um, short Stories Award for an autobiographical short story of coming out mm -hmm. and it talked about leaving the county right. because of the lack of safety and support here. Yeah. So. Well, I think what you bring up, especially with the most recent attack in Coeur d'Alene, is how much racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia is all intertwined. It all stems from the same root of hate. So as part of supporting and taking any type of action to it, it's also 
undoing those other forms of discrimination. In the last year, our school board has had, like most school boards in this country, quite a raucous debate over um, what they are deeming critical race theory. It's not critical race theory. My dissertation is on critical race theory. I'm the only one in the country who has data on the impact of critical race theory on high school students. It's not what's going on there, but people get riled up over the term. Um, and undoing that and going out to speak up for the importance of educating kids and giving them basic resources in libraries is really critical. Um, there are other small things you can do. Request LGBTQ young adult fiction for the library, right? You can go on our library's websites throughout the county and you put in a request for those books that you wanted to read as a kid or read as a kid that made a difference. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure they're available to our kids. And then as the school board has hearings, we in California we've passed laws over the last several years around what needs to be included in curriculum for LGBTQ plus students. So as those come up, as community members to come up and say, yes, I want to see this in my school, whether it is comprehensive sex ed, let's, let's talk about it's not just heterosexual P and V and that's what we're going, and here's how to put a condom on a banana. Like that is not useful for some of us. Um, <laughs> my exploration with girls had nothing to do with condoms. Uh, <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. So making sure they have access and the language to talk about that and space to do it because queer youth, are, we're much more likely to try and kill ourselves. 40% of us try to off ourselves before the age of 18 and they find the risk of that drops by over 40% if you have one supportive adult. Can you right. repeat that last sentence please? So it's important. Over 40% of queer youth try to kill themselves mm -hmm. before the age of 18 and that risk drops significantly. They estimated around a 40% drop in risk if they have one supportive adult. So to have a librarian or a teacher when you don't have that support at home is right. so critical in making it to adulthood. Right, and the numbers are even higher for the transgender yep. community. Um, I think it's currently 68% decrease in depression for, people who have German, for young people who have gender affirming care and 70, over 70% of a decrease in suicidal attempts and ideation. That's yeah. huge. Just That's a huge by decrease, just by the providing R -R care. The right. for an ally, yeah. right. for someone to be an ally, whether or not you identify anywhere on our alphabet soup spectrum, mm -hmm. you can be an ally mm -hmm. and, and not just make a difference in someone's life, but actually help them to want to continue to be on the planet right. just by reaching out. Absolutely. I mean, that's an actionable item that all of us should be taking, mm -hmm. not just could be. I once had someone ask me why I put my pronouns on my Zoom profile when it's obviously I'm she, her. And I said, you do that because for the person it's not obvious for, you show up for them. And so I think there are just really small things that we can do to think about inclusivity, and that's one. Right. And when we move forward trying to think about the things that we don't necessarily know we don't know, or really reaching out, and if someone corrects you on something, you know, I know, I know that we have um, kind of this current idea of, of quote unquote cancel culture, um, but I have had a lot of counsel culture um, for me because you don't know what you don't know. And being able to hear someone and listen to what they need and, and and then yes and that, mm -hmm. and accept that that's what they need and move forward by being an ally in the way that, that people need allies, I think is really important as well. Right. Got it. Um, I'd like to, con I think this is an important conversation, especially for members of our community who may be watching this at home, who, who don't know what, they, they just, they hear the words, and they have assigned a definition that maybe they assume that means. So how about if we talk a little bit about terminology, about language, 
Um, what does it mean to be non-binary? What does it mean to be trans? What does it mean to be queer? All, all that. Let's let's open and I'll stop dropping my glasses. Let's open that up a little bit. Okay? Yeah. So. So as a person who identifies as non-binary um, and transmasculine, I didn't come out as non-binary until I was 35 because I didn't have the language. I knew when I was a kid that I didn't fit either male or female. I fit both and none <laughs> all at the same time. And there are a lot of other identities um, and like new terminology that kind of fit under the non-binary umbrella. And it can be really confusing for people who really don't know, and that's okay. What's important is that we recognize and acknowledge and do the work to understand what's important to the person mm -hmm. in terms of their identity, their pronouns, and how they describe themselves. Love that. Thank you. I want to piggyback on what Della said because I've talked to a number of trans folks up here who have said their work environments are incredibly hostile and even asking for the respect of using the appropriate pronouns, wearing a pronoun pin that says my pronouns are they, or you know, that, that their coworkers will mock them. Mm -hmm. And that it's even asking for that minimal level of respect has been problematic in our workspaces. So even just reinforcing in your workspace, no, this is just basic colleague to colleague respect. It's, it's nothing more than that. It's like using somebody's appropriate name, right? Mm -hmm. um, instead of calling them Princess Post-it note, you use their name, right? And you don't have to respect them, but you, you know, it's, it's a minimal level of courtesy. And I think in Nevada County, that's been particularly difficult for our trans community. Um, I identify as queer. I, I came out as bisexual at 14, which was 35 years ago, because that was the new and exciting word that described me. We now have a whole series of words that describe it. Um, and I'm agender. I don't care about gender. It, it's never made sense to me. I have no attachment to various gendered body parts. Uh, I, you know, I tell folks I have the Mr. Potato Head fantasy. I didn't want to be Barbie. I wanted to be Mr. Potato Head because I could swap out the parts that I wanted during the day. Like, ooh, today I feel like a bare chest and a great Hmm. You know, <laughs> that's what I'm feeling. Oh, no, no, we're traveling. We're just putting all the genitals on the shelf. It's safer, uh, <laughs> right? And I think so. That falls under the non-binary spectrum. Non-binary is a term in Western culture we're really trying to grasp. Um, and I do a podcast where I interview folks all across the gender spectrum, and it's been fascinating because of one of the largest collections of non-binary folks talking about what it means to be non-binary, and it's a little different for everybody. It's just, at the root of it, you don't feel like you fit in male or female. And then there's all sorts of versions of what that is. Um, but you don't have to understand somebody's specifics to respect them, to use the proper language, to call them the name they want. Um, and I mean, little things like my doctor's office ask you what name you want to be addressed by in case it's not the legal name on your insurance card. Right. Something that small makes an enormous difference when we're seeking care. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've I think we've come a long way with language. I think we're starting to hopefully get into a space even within our own community, because I know that this is hard. I remember like if you were bisexual, it was like somehow a huge affront to the lesbians. I was um, at conferences where we decided whether or not to put the B in LGB. Like I've been out that late, it was an issue. Yes. Like, we, we had national conferences on this. It's, it's, been, it's been, I mean, and, and there's, there's still a lot of an uphill battle on this one, unfortunately, but I think that we've come a long way with language. I think we've come a long way understanding that there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum on gender. There's a spectrum on sexuality. That um, there are many different ways to show up in the world with those things. I think you had brought up comprehensive sex education, and you used the term P and V, mm -hmm. uh, penis and vagina, which is, I know that one. Um, because literally sixth grade, they like separated the boys and the girls. They told the girls about their periods. 
um, and our virginity and, and that sex was penis and vagina. Well, it would have saved my ex-husband a lot of trouble if someone would have explained it's actually a lot different than that and can be a lot more. Right. Um, and I think we're still coming through a lot of these things and we're still working this out, not just generally as a society, not just in comprehensive age-appropriate sex education, not just in the way we talk about consent, we talk about, yeah. um, you know, what's sexy, what's fun, what's interesting, but also in the way that we talk about it in our own community um, and as we sort of get a better idea about how intimacy actually works. And I think as we talk about getting away from violence and moving into love, I think that's a part of the whole spectrum of the conversation is to be able to understand that intimacy can be a lot of things right. and it can be really beautiful in a lot of ways. And I think as soon as we stop talking about coitus as the end all be all whatever um, and actually having real conversations about what love looks like and how it can show up, that's where we, we end up with resources for young people, resources for all people, resources for our community. Absolutely, and teaching kids that love is love. Yeah. And we can use the, the word love to describe any relationship. You know, it's an, we, we talk about identity and we're talking, you know, like in terms of gender, we're talking about our identity, which is how we see ourselves, our expression, which is how we communicate that to the world, and then the roles that like society places on us based on what's between our legs when mm -hmm. we're born, mm -hmm. or assumptions of what's there. Right. <laughs> and when we're talking about sexuality, we're talking about a tr you know, romantic attraction, sexual attraction, and those are also different spectrums. And then again, identity, how you see yourself and behavior. So like, we're parsing out a lot of details here and the language that we have now encompasses those details. And then, you know, it really helps people kind of pigeonhole where they are. But something else to consider is that identity changes throughout our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, we're born, we're children, and then we're students, and then we're young adults, and then, you know, we have some kind of a career, maybe. We might get married, we might not. We might be retired, we might become parents. You know, those are all identities, and they all change. And sexuality and gender are no different. Those can change throughout the course of our life, too. And a lot of times we recognize those in other more medical and clinical ways but it's still a part of our identity. And a lot of the work that I do you know, as a therapist is just processing those changes, those life changes of identity. And for all that is good in the world, stop worrying about what somebody has in their pants. I, I have to say, as somebody who identifies as non-binary, the number of people who've asked me what my genitals look like freak me out, right? It doesn't matter if you where you are in the gay community or the straight community, all you gotta know is they're mine. And if I wanna share them with you, I'll share them with you. But beyond that, it's none of your business. And if somebody is transitioning, know that the one thing they don't have in their pants is a hundred grand to necessarily get the transition surgery and it's none of your business, right? So yeah. if we could just stop one thing, I would love to stop being asked what I have between my legs. I think, you know, I, I keep, I, 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 as we're talking about these conversations and how important it is to respect um, someone's individual journey mm -hmm. with sexuality and with gender and the difference between those two things, mm -hmm. I just keep coming back to those stats. Yeah. I keep coming back to those stats of how many of our young people are attempting to kill themselves and succeeding killing themselves because of the um, misinformation mm -hmm. and the lack of awareness and allies and support. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've given uh, some great resources and examples of ways to support our youth. Now, being at the age I am, I'd also like to talk about ways that our community associates those of us who are elders in the community. And how do we see our elders in the LGBTQ community? What kind of respect is given to those that have been on the front lines, carrying the signs, fighting, um, being activists, 
for time and memorial. Um, how, how do we respect them and what place do we make for them in our communities? Right. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a fun one. I'm in that in-between demographic. <laughs> Um, I came out at the age of 12 and mm -hmm. was um, as bi, and I was involved at what was the Lambda Center in Sacramento oh, back in the early 90s, and that was the height of the, of the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. And at the, in those days, we were fighting to not just the AIDS crisis, but there was a lot of respectability politics, and mm -hmm. bisexual and transgender people were not allowed to have our own groups. Yeah. Things have changed, thankfully. <laughs> We were fighting for that then because the gay and lesbian community was fighting for respectability to get our needs as a community met. And that fight was to not, not have easy. our children taken away from us. Exactly, exactly. Our health care needs, all healthcare of it. Oh, yep. And, you know, one of the things that I come across now is, you know, again, like kind of going back to the language thing, we look at the stories of people who came before us. And I think it's really important to know where we all came from. And I think it's important to respect the language that people use based on the time that they came out and whatever language is appropriate for that time. You just see me getting all Italian yep. over here. <laughs> because I have to follow that up with why pride? Right, right. So Okay, can we talk about Stonewall? Can we talk about where this the need for people right. say, well, why do you need a month? Right. I don't, I'm straight. I don't need a month to celebrate being straight. You have a Chick-fil-A line. Let's, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just maybe for people who don't know right. and, and just, uh, uh, you know, give a, a historical um, con um, bucket right. for why. Right. Why? Well, Stonewall was a riot that was started by transgender women of color who were protecting themselves and gay men from being arrested at bar raids in New York. It was not the first riot. We had the Compton's Cafeteria riots in San Francisco two years prior to that. Um, so that was 1967 in Compton. Um, and that was started because gay men would and transgender women would be arrested in bars and then raped by the police, beaten by the police, and then have their names published in the newspaper. Their lives would be ruined just for trying to find community and be who they were. Well, and what gets left out is that for decades and decades before that, we had the same push for laws that, we're that so many of our laws are trying to drag us back to, right? Mm -hmm. Until the 1970s, you had to have three pieces of gender appropriate clothing when you were out in public in almost every city in this country, and if you did not, you could be arrested, right? Uh, until the 70s. Until 1974, you could be permanently institutionalized in a psychiatric institution because you were gay, right? right? And your families could sign the papers and put you away. Right. Um, we didn't get it off the books until the 90s where homosexuality was no longer considered a mental health right. issue, right? DSM Gender anymore. dysphoria still is. Gender dysphoria yes, is. still is. Um, and so, what gets lost, especially as we focus so much on youth, is so many of the struggles for those of us who've been around longer, is that this really, we understand what it's like to fight for our lives. I was part of the generation that nursed gay men, waves and waves yes. of our friends died, yes. right? We are missing so many of our elders because they didn't make it, right? Which is one of the reasons LGBT, Q folks over 45 are the most immunized people against COVID because we know what it's like when the government ignores us and lets us die, right? Um, and it is a conscious decision to let us die. So when we're creating these spaces, one, I think it's recognizing that, you know, our elder, you may be 60, 70, you know, 80, 90, going out to pride, don't shun them, like give them service at the bar, right? This is one of the problems that some of our elderly queer folks, and I, I'm in that group now, um, I die because I'm not ready to commit to the gray. Um, but you go into a bar and they don't necessarily want to give you service because you're not the young cute thing anymore, right? Um, so doing stuff like that, understanding. <laughs> oh, heaven for femme. Uh, heaven for femme. <laughs> um, but, and understand that when your, your gay elders are showing up at Pride in kink wear, 
expressing their sexuality, like making this not a totally family friendly, you know, safe for the kids party, it's because that was why they were attacking us. This is why we were dying. This was why our government allowed us to die and allowed us to be imprisoned. And so yeah, you've got, we can't have just family friendly pride because those of us who have fought these battles fought it because of who we were. And it was not because they were afraid two lesbians were going to go adopt some cute little third world baby, right? That was not, that's never been a big political issue. It's because two gay guys want to hook up at a bar. Like that's what, or you know, a lesbian wants to wear her keys and her cargo shorts. Like those were the reasons we were persecuted. So to have that space at Pride and recognize that our sexuality is core to why we were prosecuted um, and why we were shunned. Mm -hmm. I think part of all patriarchal institution, it favors white over people of color, favors men over women, favors homosexuality over hetero, or heterosexuality over homosexuality. It favors traditional family relationships it is a part of, a, in a, a, of an oppressive system altogether. But one of the things that the patriarchal system also does is it favors youth over, yep. right. mm. over those aging. And this is actually an institutional issue. It's an institutional issue for people who are aging as much as it is an institutional issue when it comes to the gender spectrum, when it comes to uh, how how we show up in the world, whether we're gender nonconforming, whether we are LGBTQ, all of those things, and you see it in policy. And I think this is really, really important. And I think for everybody who cares about policy, who cares about dismantling the system of patriarchy that has kept us in boxes, uh, our aging population is one of those cornerstone populations that need assistance in policy. The fact that we don't have housing that is accessible by design is a travesty. Every single one of our new developments for housing can be accessible by design. Widen the doors, mm -hmm. make it accessible. There should be a percentage of all new housing in every state in this nation, but especially in California because we have the progressive will to do it and it's not happening, it drives me nuts. And to think about, because all of us are able-bodied until we're not. Every single one of us will eventually not be, whether it's because we break our toe because we kicked something, <laughs> not that that's happened to me, or because we uh, do have a body, bodily evolution that eventually breaks down. All of that needs to be a part of our policy making and we need to understand that when we are not doing that for our elders, that that is discrimination that is ingrained and based out of the same system of oppression mm -hmm. that has always been a part of the conversation against the LGBTQ right. plus community as well. Well, and accessibility, not just in terms of disability, but also accessibility for housing for our elders because prices are going up. Yep. And people on retirement incomes cannot afford most of what's available mm -hmm. even for their demographic. Yep. And, you know, the number of homeless people on the streets that are LGBT spans all ages, not just youth, although there is a disproportionate number of youth yeah. that are homeless, that are LGBT. Yeah. <clears throat> so panel, we have only a couple minutes left. What I would like to do is to give um, each of you an opportunity, if you were to say anything to the world about um, anything, about who you are, about a, a topic that's important to you in, in 90 seconds. Um, what would you want the world to know? Whether it's been discussed yet or not, what would you like the world to know? And Del, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, I have to choose. Yeah. I might need to defer, because I have a hard time Okay, choosing. that's fine. Let's start in the middle and move. Ooh, look at us outside there the box. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Vice? Public policy is a moral issue, right? And in this country, we are failing across the board. Our, queer youth, our queer middles, our queer elders, we are failing to protect them. I have had 
over two dozen conversations with different therapists in the last two weeks that say this legislative assault is so demoralizing and distressing. People are coming to therapy trying to just process the amount of hate in the world. We have to be on our politicians to make those decisions that support our community, and you have to dismantle this whole cluster of uh, policies that include anti-trans, anti-homophobia, sexism, racism, colonialism, because it's all tied together, and the same people who hate one group hate the rest of us, and they move from state to state, right? This is the joy of, of transportation these days. So you can't opt out of the political system, and hope for a moral outcome that's going to support the community. You have to contact your, co your politicians and let them know these are the things that are important to me. Fantastic, thank you. Um, on the Congresswoman? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Councilwoman, I'm hoping. <laughs> well, that would have been what I would have said. And I'm gonna take a total, total left turn. So, I learned about Ani DeFranco. Hmm? when I was 16 years old, after meeting just this beautiful, beautiful dyke at an ACLU conference at UC Berkeley, and we spent a rainy afternoon making love, and I picked up the CD, and on the back of it, I saw that this bald-headed, gorgeous woman had amazing grace on her CD. And I have seen Ani DeFranco 30 times in concert waiting for her to do that. She is going to be here on the 28th, and if she doesn't sing Amazing Grace, I just don't know what I'm going to do. So I grew up singing in church, and being able to see someone who looked like me and the people I loved also have a song that I grew up singing in church on her CD, which, by the way, was released on vinyl this year. Mm -hmm. um, was super inspiring to me. And everything that you've said, because as the politician on the stage, I absolutely agree. But also, I think Ani DeFranco should sing Amazing Grace when she comes to Grass Valley. I'll make a call. No? I absolutely can't disagree with any of that. I, yeah. <laughs> I have the same CD. I think it's in my car. Yeah. Uh, with the little righteous babe on the back. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, the new one, oh my gosh, Re Revolutionary Love. Uh, and honestly, like, that's what queerness is. Yeah. It's not just who we love in the community, it's loving ourselves. And queerness is about doing what we need to do to make our lives work. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, how many different ways do we have to step outside boxes in our lives? And how many di different ways can we define ourselves as queer without ever touching the realm of sexuality or gender that's identity? Right. You know, you. so that's not exactly what I planned on saying, but it fits. That's what organically <laughs> came out. And, and I'll right. say for me, um, if, if any of you saw the, the little commercial that we did for this event, it was um, all of us in one outfit and then we changed to another outfit quickly. And, and the, the messaging was inclusion that, that don't always believe everything you see. So when you're out in the world and you see people and your first thought is, are they? Are they male? Are they female? Are they, or you see someone like me, and well, obviously she's female. Don't believe everything you see because our community needs to be seen for who we are, not who you think we are. Right. It's vital to our survival, especially our youth's survival. Right. So on that note, we are going to wrap it up and invite all of you out into the lobby for goodies and swag and conversation, and we are available to answer your questions and have more discussions. So thank you, Nevada County TV, for this opportunity and for everyone for showing up.